Evans Docket. It's case number 110262, State v. Brownlee. Mr. Brownlee appears through Council Michelle Davis. May I please reserve three minutes for rebuttal? Three minutes is granted. Um, this is a case where uh, there was a shooting after a party at a house, and uh, some gentlemen had gotten into an altercation. There were some uh, one gentleman had inappropriately touched the defendant's sister, and then there was an argument that ensued, and then things appeared to calm down a little bit, and then the argument picked back up again and went outside and. Uh, there was some testimony about the defendant and the deceased uh, arguing and struggling outside when the when the individual was shot. And um, so we've raised several issues in our brief. Probably the one to start with is the statutory speedy trial claim. Um, this is a case where uh, defense counsel and the prosecutor met with the court and continued the trial setting. And probably the best case for us is the Taylor case, the Court of Appeals case that's attached to our brief. And the finding in that case is where the defendant was not brought to the hearing and was not given the opportunity to voice his disagreement or agreement with the continuous request by counsel, then the delay could not be attributed to the defendant. So we what, have that basic let's starting Let's jump point. ahead here. What, what impact does the, the, the hold have on this when he's not being solely held on these charges? Being, he's also being unbeknownst, at uh -huh. the time anyway, mm -hmm. um, to the court, but he was being held on a uh, parole violation. Well, I would just have several uh, responses to that. But first of all is uh, this claim wasn't raised below. And so you're basically asking me about something, evidence that was not put before the district court. Um, the state <coughs> added this information to the record on appeal. This information was not in the district court record. And usually we tell our clients we can't bring in new information into the appeal, even if it help, helps your case, because this court is only supposed to consider what's in the district court record. This was not in the district court record? No. So the, the state added to the record on appeal. Added the to the record on detainer. appeal, but does that mean it wasn't already in the district court record? That's right. It wasn't already in the district court record. Not in this case. Not in this case, right. They just went and got the detainer and added it to the record. It was not in the district court record. And it wasn't discussed at any point. Right, because the state never raised this claim below. So they're basically asking you to consider evidence that we would say is not in the record and that it would be improper for this court to consider. I mean, in my brief, I went ahead and addressed it. And I can do that again today, but basically our argument in the brief is that the fact of a detainer does not mean that Mr. Brownlee is being held by the jail because the language in the detainer itself says, when you execute this, we will come and get him and we will take him to one of our facilities and he will see the prisoner review board. So the very language of the warrant itself, assuming you were to consider that as new evidence brought in on this appeal, uh, defeats the idea that he was held by Wyandotte County because of this warrant. Because the warrant itself says, we're gonna take you to KDOC once you execute this. What and they the didn't statute, execute it for a year. I'm sorry, just What in the so statute good. requires Wyandotte County to be the, the, the group that's holding them, the entity that's, as long as he's in state custody, uh -huh. does it matter who, where he's held or who's holding him, which well, agency it is? Yeah, let me look at the statute. I thought it was held solely He's held solely on account of, held, held in jail solely by reason thereof. So I'm assuming they're meaning held in jail solely by reason thereof, meaning held in jail on the charges. That he's being, any person charged with a crime and held in jail solely by reason thereof. So it would be my position that the only way that would apply would be if he was there was another charge in that county and he was being held in that jail because of another charge in that county. 
Just so be even. in jail. Because under mm -hmm. the detainer, he wouldn't be held in jail. He'd be held elsewhere. Is that what you're saying? In held in jail. You're right. It's the in jail that you're relying upon. Right. But I think the held in jail, um, he's being held solely because of this case. So theoretically, if this case disappeared, what would happen to him? And then at that point, they would theoretically, I guess, have executed the warrant, and he would have been taken to uh, KDSC, but this case would have gone away. I mean, he's being held in jail solely by reason of this case. The warrant hasn't been we executed. It's just the, the interpreted detainer. it that way, though, have we? Well, I think the cases that where you've held that he's being held because of something else, there's been some evidence to establish that, that he's being held like the case I cited in my brief. They're saying he would have been held. Uh, there was evidence to support that he would have been held because of it. But haven't we applied it where there have been, it's been because of a parole hold or even an ice hold, not necessarily because, as you've argued, a, a hold that would keep him right in that county's jail. Right, but in those cases, I mean, there was evidence. In right, I understand that. Okay. But I'm just looking at that statutory well, construction of, mm -hmm. does our case law support your argument that it has to be something that would keep them in that facility, in that jail? But I don't think the case, I think the case law wasn't contested by the defense that he was going to be held because of, and there was evidence, or there was evidence in front of the district court. It's just not an issue that's been addressed. Is right, I don't think it was... Well, you would be held somewhere in the state of Kansas, so and I don't think the case law supports that that issue was examined, but uh, I think, Justice Rosen, your, your question is appropriate because the way I read the state's brief is that the state's not contesting that the defendant did not acquiesce in the continuance, and so therefore the delay should not be attributed to him. The way I read the state's brief, they're saying the speedy trial statute just doesn't apply. And so at this point, unless the court has questions, I would move on, given that that's the state's position. The defendant filed a motion to um, assert speedy trial rights, or what, what was that, that motion? Right, that's correct. Before the arraignment, he was held on May 25th. Um, he filed in July 2nd a pro se motion invoking his statutory right to a speedy trial. And he wasn't arraigned then until uh, September 12th. September 12th, 12th. that's yeah. correct. And, and, okay, so uh, what, is, what's, what are you arguing is the impact of, of that document filed by the defendant? I'm just saying that everybody was on notice. I mean, they should be on notice anyway because it's a state and the court's obligation, but he was clear that he was exercising this right. This was important to him. And um, then the fact that they didn't then bring him down so he could, regarding that issue, when the court at the, had already noted at the arraignment that he was asserting a speedy trial and the court was aware of it. So just for that emphasis. So um, I think, unless there are questions, the other issues, the state raises some other claims about uh, why they should be able to raise this for the first time on appeal, and I address those in my brief, and then why the uh, 2012 amendment to the speedy trial statute doesn't apply, because it has language where the defendant or the de attorney in consultation with the defendant requests a delay, and that we didn't have that in this case. But, but if you read those two sentences together, wouldn't mm -hmm. that... Uh, when the second sentence uses broader language... Um, when it, you know, if a delay is initially attributed to the defendant, but is it necessarily tied back to only when the defendant has made the request for a continuance? Doesn't that second sentence seem to broaden the scope through that first mm -hmm. phrase? And could you repeat your question? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I understand the first sentence talks about if a defendant mm -hmm. makes the request, uh, request a delay, but then... <coughs> You know, if a delay is initially attributed to the defendant, is that necessarily tied to only if a request has been made by a defendant? And a, or is it just any time? Is it are they trying to cover the whole mm -hmm. whole ballpark of situations where a delay has been initially attributed to the defendant? Okay, I, I think if you're going to do that, you would split those sentences out, and that would be in a separate subsection. The fact that those are all within the same subsection means they have to be re read together. 
because then you can drop down below and there's another subsection where it talks about delay. And so that sentence can't then apply to just any delay. And I mean, if you're going to read that sentence that broadly, then there's almost, and there's, with the next subsection, there'd almost be no statutory right to a speedy trial because it would cover any time anything was done that was incorrect, it wouldn't matter. I mean, if the delay is initially true to the defendant under any circumstances where it shouldn't have been, and then it's not going to matter, well, there's no, I mean, there's no, I think it has to be narrowly construed in, in favor of just applying to the limited circumstances in that subsection. So I will move on from the speedy trial issue. And the second issue I wanted to talk about was the failure to instruct on voluntary manslaughter heat of passion. This was a requested instruction. Um, and I think the evidence here does support the giving of this instruction, the evidence viewed in the light most favorable to the defense, that this was a situation of, of high tension and escalation. And also then you've got the physical altercation taking place outside when the shots were fired. And um, the state's trying to argue, well, the initial provocation is too far removed from the act of the shooting, and the initial provocation being the inappropriate touching of the sister. Um, but it's our position, basically, that the tensions are building here, and that it's not just the initial provocation. It's an ongoing series of events. And at some point, it, it just escalated. And it culminated in the physical altercation outside. But all of this taken together, and there, there could have been, a jury could infer that there something happened outside. In fact, there was one witness that testified that the defendant and the deceased had talked about fighting before they went outside. And so during the process of this argument, fighting outside, that there, there was some tipping point where a reasonable person could have gone over the edge. And so the, all these events have to be read together. Um, the state, of course, has the burden here showing that the error was not harmless. And given the evidence here, that it, there is a reasonable possibility here that the jury could have convicted of voluntary manslaughter, so we believe that that should have been given. That would conclude my comments, unless there are questions from the court. Any questions? Thank you, counsel. May it please the court, uh, Jennifer Tatum, Assistant District Attorney from Wayneck County on behalf of the state. I'll start with the speedy trial argument. Um, our argument on that issue is basically three-pronged. At the onset, I would note that we concede that this defendant had a statutory right to be present at the hearing on September, I believe it was 28th, 2012. We're not conceding that he had a constitutional right to be there, but we are conceding he had a statutory right to be there um, especially when he had already filed that pro se motion indicating that he wanted his trial set within speedy trial time and the parties were aware of that. Um, however, with regards to his right to be present, we would argue that right, that violation was harmless um, because first of all, he had the parole hold and I'll discuss that more later in my argument. But second of all, because of the overwhelming evidence in the case, several of these justices asked uh, Ms. Davis what the impact was of him not being present at that September hearing. Um, and I don't know that she answered that question or that she could. Um, I, I don't know that it ultimately impacted his trial. The evidence was the same. I mean, this is somebody who was tried within 115 days of his arraignment, uh, which is not counting that court's 30-day continuance at the end there, but that's, that's um, much less time than we've seen in some cases with, with some defendants that come before this court. So I would argue that because of the parole hold and because of the overwhelming evidence in this case, which includes four eyewitnesses <coughs> identifying this defendant as the shooter of the victim, um, that the error was harmless, that his right to be present, the fact that he wasn't there, that was harmless. Go back to your 115 days. Clo close is good. Close makes it uh, less harmless than... Um, I don't... You know, I think it can I, I under certain that. I mean, circumstances. 90 days is 90 days, isn't it, plus whatever else you might get? It is, and obviously the statute is there for us to comply with it, and it's a serious thing, and we take it seriously. However, I think the longer you get <laughs> past 
there's that period, you know, witnesses become available, memories fade, things like that can happen. The defendant doesn't have any of those arguments in this case. And that's why I brought up the 115 days, not to make light of the statutory requirement, but just to say, in this case, he had no argument that because of the delay, you know, he didn't have <coughs> witnesses available to him or experts avail available to him, things like that. Well, it's about, it's about confinement. It's about, you know, this person's being confined and he has a right to, to hear hear the case within 90 days of his confinement. That's basically what it's about, unless he acquiesces or asks for a continuance of those. And that's what he wanted to do, but in this case, there were other circumstances. Uh, this wasn't a case like, um, for instance, the case Ms. Davis attached to her reply brief, the Gore case, where it was the prosecutor who was seeking the continuances because she had other cases set and those were coming first. In this case, uh, the defendant was trying to hire his own counsel. And so the court, I think, um, although we made a mistake not having him at that hearing, was trying to respect his right to go forward to trial with the counsel of, of his choosing within that amount of time. And that just didn't happen. Um, and at the end, actually, this court appointed the attorney Mr. Bradley wanted to hire and couldn't. Uh, and so I think, yes, the, the time is serious, but I think other things were going on in this case. Um, Are you... Um suggesting that we would apply a harmless error analysis if there's a violation by to, making that argument? To his right to be present, yes. I would but, suggest. But not, to, but not to the speedy trial violation, if there was a speedy trial violation? Yes, I think you'd apply it to that too. But I'm sorry, I wanted to start just with his right with to be present. just his right to be present. Yes, ma'am. Um, moving on then, the second and third problems. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little unclear on what basis we would be applying harmless error to the 90-day speedy, statutory speedy trial. I thought that was uh, structural error, that if you don't get it done in 90 days, the defendant is released. Um, well, based on some of the other cases I read and cited in my brief, like the Key case and the George case, in Fonseca, I do believe they discuss speedy trial. If I'm wrong, I apologize. Or, I'm sorry, I, I do believe they discuss a, har a harmless error analysis. Okay. Um, moving now to the parole hold. Um, the parties didn't discuss this at the time of the continuance. I can't tell you why. Any reason I gave you would just be speculation. Um, but I believe the, par the parties were aware of it. Justice Breyer, I think, was the one who asked, was there any evidence in the district court's record of this hold? And I would argue there was, uh, just based on the journal entry of sentencing, when the court ran the sentence consecutive to the 09 case. I think there's some evidence the parties knew that was out there. Um, however, the records regarding his detainer from KDOC, I added to the record on appeal, because that was not discussed. Um, so is there any way for us to consider that? Yes, I believe that the Barnes exceptions apply. Um, I know that the defendant's arguing we shouldn't be here bringing up an argument that we didn't mention at the district court level. However, these exceptions apply because there is an exception to that rule. And in fact, many times parties appear before you and ask you to apply those, and I'm doing the same thing. Do they I ask us to open the record and take additional facts? Um, I mean, I don't, isn't that essentially what you're asking us to do, is to open the record on appeal and take additional evidence? I don't think that's what I'm asking because I do believe there is some evidence that was in the record at the district court level that this other case existed. I guess I'm asking you to flesh it out a little bit. With, with your facts. Yes. What, what evidence is there that just because there's a prior conviction that there's a parole hold? How did we get that connection? Well, I believe that shows there's another case he's being being held on, especially if a sentence is to run consecutive, and that's what the court ordered, I believe it's a matter of common sense then that he was being held on another crime, if that's included in the journal entry. Um, so with the Barnes exceptions, the first one is, um, is this a question of law arising or unproved or admitted facts? I do think that there is some basis um, <coughs> to argue that the district court was aware of the parole hold and that this is determinative of the final issue of the case. Obviously, if he had the hold and he wasn't being held in Wyandotte County solely uh, for this case, then the speed trial statute doesn't apply. Uh, second of all, I think the ends of justice require you to consider this issue at this time. Um, 
Mr. Brownlee was convicted by a jury of 12 in Wyanoke County, and the fact that they convicted him should be important to this court. It's important to the community, and also he was convicted of first-degree murder, which is one of the most serious crimes on the book. So I think the ends of justice require you to consider this information rather than to outright dismiss the case. Um, I think that the third exception is, can you uphold the district court's judgment because he was right for the wrong reasons? And I would argue that in this case, um, I think he was wrong to assess that time from September to October against the defendant. However, if he had mentioned the parole hold, that would have solved the problem. So I guess in, in my words, he was wrong for the right reasons. And that's why I think you can consider this parole hold. I read the Hill case. Um, I think Justice Lukert mentioned the Montez Mata case earlier too with the INS holds. I think this court has clearly held if someone has a parole hold, they're not being held solely uh, for purposes of the case against them. So I think if you consider the parole hold, you can decide that the speedy <coughs> trial statute didn't apply to Mr. Brownlee. We can move on that way. Um, my third argument, kind of our final fallback position, is that the statute was amended in April of 2012 um, to allow more time to try a defendant in custody. We moved from 90 to 150 days. Um, the statute also was amended to add some language, and I'm paraphrasing here, but um, to the effect that no case should be, no conviction should be reversed um, based on a violation of the statute unless it was constitutional and unless it involved prosecutorial misconduct. Um, I don't think this defendant, well, he didn't raise a constitutional speed trial violation at the time of, at the district court level. Um, and I don't think he could argue that based on the small amount of time he was actually held before he received his trial. Second of all, there's no allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. So I think if we tried the case today, that's the first step. If we tried it today, the statute would not, you know, st the statute would apply. But can we apply it, apply it retroactively is the question. And our argument is that you can um, because it's providing a procedural rule, not a substantive rule. It's not setting out a new crime or a new punishment. It's basically setting forth a procedure in order to bring a defendant to trial and what happens if you violate the statute. So I would argue that it can be applied retroactively. I um, understood your argument in your brief to be you wanted us to apply the um, subsection G. You have t this today mentioned the 150 days. Are you asking us to apply that provision retroactively as well? I don't think I asked that in my brief. No, I'm not. I'm not. I guess I was using it as an example, but no. Okay. That's all I have on the speedy trial issue. Unless you have questions, I'll move on to the voluntary manslaughter instruction. What's your response to Ms. Davis's argument about the construction of G and the limitation of that being to a defense request for continuance? Do you um, think that's what happened here? I mean, counsel, I guess, did he request or did he acquiesce? Are you asking me um, if, if I believe the defendant acquiesced in the continuance? Well, defense counsel. Because I think that the statute is phrased if defendant or defendant's attorney mm -hmm. in consultation with the defendant. So do we have that fact? Well, I don't think we do. I mean, I the defense counsel asked for continuance, and he was very clear about that. But he was also clear that his client was critical of that decision and didn't want it. And the defendant also had filed a motion that he wanted his trial within the speedy trial time. And so I'm not going to stand in front of you and say that, you know, the defendant acquiesced in it. So does that section apply here? Even if we would agree with you and say it's procedural, does, does, do the facts fit the exception? I think that you could apply the exception. This court can. Even though the defendant, as you just said, didn't acquiesce with his counsel's request, clarify for me what, what defense counsel said. Did defense counsel describe a consultation? In other words, did, did he say, I, I've talked to my client and my client doesn't want this continuance, but I think we need it. And I'm, I'm just making that up, but well, on the September, what happened? The September hearing, the one where the defendant wasn't present, right. Mr. Colgan um, came to court and said, I want to continue it because my client has told me he's trying to hire this new attorney, Ms. McBratney, and I don't want to set a jury trial uh, for some other attorney when I don't have their calendar. That's what he said at that hearing. Well, at, but he also said that my client wanted me to go ahead and set the trial date, but I'm not going to set the trial date for another attorney. But he clarified 
at that point that he had been instructed to set the trial date at that hearing, did he not? I believe you're correct on that. Okay. And then at subsequent dates, um, when they had other status con conferences, he was even more clear about what, what Mr. Jo or Justice Johnson was talking about in saying, my client's critical of my decision. He wanted me to set this for trial. So, so at the hearing uh, where this um, continuance occurred, but the defendant was not present, it was clear from defense counsel's statements that he was discussing this with his client. Is I that a fair that characterization clear. from the state's perspective? Yes. Okay. And so you're reading the statute to, to be that the legislative intent is as long as you've talked to them, it doesn't matter if they said, no, don't ask. You just have to have talked to them? No, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean for you to understand my response was that. No, I don't, I don't think that's the legislative intent. So explain to me again how the statute, how that G applies. Because we don't have a request made by the defense for the in consultation with the de defendant do we no well i mean he he made a request in consultation with the defendant but the defendant didn't want him to do what to he do did it. right yeah. so does that eliminate the application of subsection g yes i'm sorry i was confused earlier about your question but yeah i i'm not asking that you apply that i don't think i argued that in my brief either I think earlier I said that subsection applies, but I think I was confused because I thought you were talking about uh, the portion of the statute that said no conviction should be reversed based on a violation of the speedy trial statute. So, so I that's, apologize. That's the only portion you ask us to apply. Yes, I apologize for my confusion on that. But that is subject subsection G. Isn't uh, it, it is. I don't. I guess going back to the question you asked, Miss Davis, was which is what you first asked me to get us on this topic. Um, I don't believe that that implicates those final words in the statute, if that makes sense in that paragraph, about no conviction shall be reversed. Um, unless there's any other questions about speedy trial, I'll move on to the voluntary manslaughter instruction. Um, and I only have about 30 seconds on that. During your time, will you address the uh, harmlessness issue? On the speedy trial? No, on voluntary manslaughter instruction. Yes, I, I will. Um, so we believe if there was an error, it was harmless, and that is because, number one, um, the jurors had an instruction on second-degree murder, um, as they should have, and they decided to acquit on that. So there's no reason to believe they would have convicted on the voluntary manslaughter. In addition to that, I would argue overwhelming evidence uh, for the purposes of harmless error we again had the four parties who identified this defendant as the shooter. We had people who said he followed the victim outside with a weapon that uh, at least two parties there uh, had tried to calm him down, that there were warning shots fired, and then that he proceeded to shoot um, the victim nine times. And that was the clear evidence in the case. So I would argue that any error in not giving voluntary manslaughter would be harmless. Um, while preserving my maintaining my stance that it shouldn't have been given at all. And I, I'm out of time now unless there are any additional questions of me. We uh, spent a lot of your time talking about the speedy trial issue. Do you need another minute to wrap <coughs> up or do you think you've made all your points? Um, I don't think I need another minute unless you have questions. Thank you for offering them. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. You reserve three minutes. Thank you. Um, just as Luker, going back to subsection G, I think just to clarify my earlier remarks, in the first sentence talks about the defendant or the attorney in consultation with the defendant. So basically this is a situation where the defendant has to want the continuance. And then it, the second sentence says if the delay is initially attributed to the defendant. So if you apply it to this situation, it totally goes against the first sentence. If you say, well, it's any delay, because then a defendant could not agree to the continuance. And as in this case, the delay was attributed to him. But what's the meaning? What's the purpose of this? If, if it, it wasn't this what the law would have been, that if a defendant requested, mm -hmm. um, what, when I can't, I don't understand this. I guess I'm trying to, struggling to come up with a circumstance where if a defendant has requested a continuance, it's ever going to be subsequently charged to the state. 
Yeah, I think it's just a sa I think it's just a safety provision, sort of the way you read the next subsection, where if supposedly the trial everybody's acting in good faith and the trial court grants this and it's requested and something on appeal comes up and it wasn't appropriately done because of that, we're not going to reverse the conviction. Isn't that I our exact scenario today? I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, at least potentially, uh, that we have a scenario where a continuance was requested by defense counsel and it was charged initially against the defendant, but subsequently was found that, that it should not have been charged against the defendant because the defendant was not present, right? Yes. So I guess my question then is, um, what's your position with regard to whether or not that request for a continuance by defense counsel was done in consultation with the defendant? Was it done in consultation with the defendant or not? Well, it's our position in consultation with implies acquiescence. Okay. And in, sec in the second part about the so good faith argument... Just if I can interrupt for a second, you're not arguing that the that defense counsel never discussed it with the defendant. Rather, you're arguing that while the defense counsel did discuss it with the defendant, the defendant did not acquiesce. That's right. Okay. And then also the Taylor case where just the fact of, that the defendant wasn't brought to the hearing means it can't be attributed to him. Um, then the statute that says the defendant has, it has to be the defendant's choice here. And then the second part about the good faith is that the court didn't respect his right, he was, his right to be present at the hearing and his right to, that this was his choice to make. And so it wasn't necessarily done in good faith. So I think it's a catch-all just to say, that's all. And then I'm running out of time, so just to move on, on the state's claim that the speedy trial statute didn't apply, that's the state's burden to prove that. The state's saying, we'll infer from a journal entry that because he had another case that this case ran consecutive to. The state has to prove he's not being held in jail solely because of this case. That's their burden to prove. So they haven't proven it, and they can't bring in new evidence in the appeal. That concludes my comments. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. We now turn.